morning, yeah. good morning. We are ending our day and you're starting your day. <laughs> <laughs> We're starting our day on a nice, cold, fresh morning. That's really nice. That's beautiful. Um, let me introduce myself. My name is Azar. I'm with ADEC. We've met in our um, meeting room when you yes. were here last few months. Yeah. So, um, Umu, if we are ready. Uh, yes, we are. Okay, so we All can right. start, yeah? Okay. I would like to warmly welcome all uh, participants of the webinar today. Um, this is our first webinar with Prof. Huxon, I think, on the topic of active learning. So, um, I would like to um, introduce our speaker today in a uh, very short short uh, manner. I'm sure he will introduce himself further and his works will explain and and um, uh, manifest who he is. So I'll, I'll just give a very short introduction as, as a as a as an opening. So professor Mark Huxham is a professor of teaching and research in environmental biology at Edinburgh Napier University. He works on the ecology of coastal ecosystems with particular expertise in mangroves, having spent many years striving to conserve and restore these remarkable forests. After researching how mangroves trap and store carbon, he helped establish the world's first community-based mangrove conservation project to be funded by the sale of carbon credits. Wow, interesting. Professor Mark also researches teaching and learning in higher education, looking at new models of partnership between teachers and students and how to use feedback and assessment to encourage deep learning. So, Professor Mark, I have been in your session uh, during uh, your visit here to Malaysia a couple of months ago, and I'm sure um, the rest of the audience will also be very interested to listen on this topic. Thank you very much. Please welcome. Thank you so much, Azar. I think you may need to give me rights to share. Oh, okay. I'll get that from Ummu. Can you see that okay? Yes, yes. It's, it's there. Yep, good. That's great. Well, thanks so much. And it's, it's really lovely to be with you here on this early morning, nice and bright and fresh. There's frost on the ground here in Scotland. Um, so nice. I feel... Uh, I feel close to you despite being a long way away. What I'd like to do um, today is to talk about the idea of active learning, which is a concept that I find very helpful in my own teaching. Um, it's quite a vague and broad concept, but despite that, I'd like to defend it as a useful, both a useful um, heuristic, a psychological trick, if you like, to remind yourself about what might be helpful in teaching. But I think it goes beyond that. I think it's got strong theoretical roots. So I'd like to give you some examples. Uh, I'd like to give you a definition of active learning. Um, some examples drawn mostly from my own practice. And some of these are backed up with pedagogical research um, to show that they're effective. But also some uh, a little bit of theory um, to, to illustrate that this is, this is rooted in, in quite a deep strain of thought um, in education, but also in, in philosophy. Um, so one the, I guess one of the reasons I'm here is that I had the real wonderful pleasure of working with Amy Ten um, from your university um, during August. And we were running a field course um, on mangrove ecology and blue carbon. And Certainly in my own mind, that was very much attempting to embody some of the principles of active learning. Um, so I'm very fortunate and grateful to have had that opportunity of working with you. So a little bit of to start with a definition, um, perhaps rather than a, a single definition, it's useful to have uh, perspectives from two or three different points of view around what active learning is, but also perhaps what it isn't. So I think a, a useful way to think about it is um, active learning involves putting knowledge to work. And in particular, um, you're putting it to work in dialogue. Uh, that's dialogue between two people, but often much more than two. Um, in context, so putting knowledge into 
the context in which you think it's it's appropriate, the authentic context. Um, and part of that, perhaps a separate category, is in feedback to students on, on tasks. Uh, so I want to cover all of those three points um, and also make the, the, the broader point that when we're thinking about learning in an active context, we're trying to think about our students as, as emotional, social and physical people. Um, and not just as repositories of information. And I know that sounds obvious, and um, I'm sure none of you would do that uh, on this seminar, but certainly sitting in some boards of studies, for example, and boards of examiners, we can have a tendency as, as lecturers and as teachers to start seeing students as uh, conduits for information and problems um, that, you know, this student hasn't sufficiently filled their brain with the information we've given them, and that's caused a problem. So we really have to be wary of that kind of thinking, and it can creep in quite easily. Um, so let me show you what I mean um, at the most basic level. Um, thinking about students and learners as, as embodied people, including physical people, <laughs> with bodies and bodily needs um, means that we have to think about, well, um, keeping them alert. And here's some interesting research um, on electrodermal activity. Electrodermal activity is, is the um, electrical pulses that can be detected in your skin. And um, effectively, if you sweat a little bit more, then electrical uh, activity increases in your skin. That's the basis for things like lie detectors. And here's some interesting research drawn from an engineering journal. And the, the focus of this research was to, to develop these really small sensors. Um, as you can see, they go on a wristband and you can people can wear them um, without interfering with their daily tasks. Um, and they detect very sensitive real-time information on electrodermal activity. So this wasn't educational research at all, um, but I was intrigued to see um, some of the results from this research because as usual with academic research, they use students as their, as their test subjects. So let's have a look at some of the results from um, a student who wore one of these bands, I think for seven days continuously. Um, so I'm just giving you four days data here, and uh, you can see that the, the student um, actually is quite stimulated during homework, what they call homework, and working in the laboratory. Um, quite uh, surprisingly, really stimulated during sleep. And that means probably the students having quite good sleep here, um, having rapid eye movement sleep. Uh, we know that, you know, emotions are processed during sleep. So it's it's interesting to see that, isn't it? But perhaps not that surprising. What I, what I want to show you, point out here, is, is the classroom uh, periods of electrodermal activity. So the classroom is not a laboratory, it's not an active class, it's not a laboratory. Um, so on day two, the, the least emotional activity, the least electrodermal activity that this student experienced was during their classes. Um, so they're less motivated, they're less stimulated during their class than they are when they're asleep. <laughs> now, I'm being slightly naughty here and I know that uh, this kind of stimulation doesn't de directly translate to, um, to, to conscious alertness, but it gives us a clue. So you can see that really the class is not very stimulating for this student. And I don't think that's that's all that surprising. Um, so that brings us to perhaps the, the standard model, if you like, of teaching in higher education. So I think most of you are probably known as lecturers, perhaps senior lecturers. We call ourselves lecturers um, in, in academia and um, Lots of universities are really proud of their proud prestigious. Of their pre Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes, I, Mark, I just we can hear you. Oh, that's fine. Okay, I just, no, I just heard someone's voice. I was just making sure all was well. Um, so many universities are very proud of their large lecture theatres. 
And, um, you know, pe universities boast about that in their project prospectus. Oh, we've got, you know, we've got a lecture theatre that takes 500 people and, th and this kind of thing. I'm not sure if that's such a great boast because uh, what we do know about lectures, the traditional form of what I might call didactic lectures, where someone does what I'm doing to you now, <laughs> which is <laughs> stands at the front or in, the, in my case sits 8,000 miles away and, um, and, and speaks at you. So when we do that, there's, there's very reliable, very, there's huge amounts of evidence of what happens to human brains and bodies. Um, and uh, I'd really recommend this book by Bly. Uh, it looks a little bit out of date, but actually the, the, it, it compiles um, hundreds of papers on um, the psychology and the sociology of lecturing. And what it finds is that uh, lectures are um, really sorry, not very good. Sorry, Prof. Haxam, we are seeing your folder, Teaching, Research and Development, not the slides. Oh, thank you for letting me know. When yeah. I've got this screen up, I can't see, I can't see what you see. Yeah. I will try, let me try this one. Is that any yep. better? Yes, yes, yes. It, uh, we can see blind now. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. And please no do worries. just, just let me know. Sure, sure, sure. Um, no worries. That's really helpful. Um, so, um, what we know about lecturing is that it's not very good at stimulating thought and at changing attitudes. Um, it's not even all that good at just imparting information. If you just want to give some passive information to people, if you just want to tell them um, about the elements of the periodic table or something, um, you can do that in a lecture, but actually it's it's not all of that, it's not all that good at even doing that. Um, so lectures aren't really very effective forms of education, but despite that, we carry on using them throughout higher education. Uh, not all institutions, but most institutions rely heavily on lectures and we still call ourselves lecturers. Now, I, I, I enjoy lecturing. You might be thinking a little bit too much. Um, and that's a danger, isn't it? Because lecturing panders to the egos of lecturers. It's, it's gratifying to have people having to listen to you. Um, but they can be, and they can be effective. And they, they, they have their uses, but we need to be careful and use them carefully. And ideally, we need to, mo if we have to lecture, and most of us do for reasons of efficiency, we need to modify what we're doing to make them more effective. Um, so going back to the physical, uh, the, the physical effect of lecturing, um, here's some data from Bly. And this refers to, um, a piece, a piece of re research a little bit similar to um, the, the one I've just shown you, but using older technology. This looks at people's heart rates in a lecture theatre. So what the researchers did was um, they asked everybody to wear a heart rate monitor and they sat through, the students were sitting through a traditional one hour lecture. And what this shows is the average heart rate in the class. And the important point here is that quite quickly after settling down, the average heart rate goes down. Now, you'd expect that because people have been moving around. And so they're settling down, relaxing, their heart rate settles. But actually, this goes down so much to um, that quite a lot of these students are going into what we might call micro sleeps. And a micro sleep is that moment where your eyes close and you, you know, you momentarily lose consciousness. Um, I'm sure none of you have seen that happening to your students in your lectures, but I certainly have in mine. And typically that happens after about 15 to 20 minutes in a lecture. Of course, it happens faster if it's very warm or if it's just after lunch. So they're important physical uh, determinants of this. So basically people are going to sleep in this lecture and um, what the arrows show on the slide is when um, the researcher asks a question. Now, the the line shows the average heart rate here. Um, so it's not surprising that if you ask a question in a lecture, the student who responds or to whom you ask the question um, 
is stimulated, uh, is alerted. You know, their heart rate goes up. But what's interesting is that the heart rate of everybody in the room on average increases. So suddenly people are aware that there's a dialogue or an attempt at dialogue going on here. Um, so the whole the whole room kind of wakes up and then um, second that same thing happens again. And then the second arrow um, increases heart rate. So this is supporting just a very, very simple and obvious thing to do, which is attempt to have discourse, attempt to have uh, questions in your lectures. And it's surprising, actually, again, we all think that we do this. I'd really recommend if you haven't done this, getting people to sit in your lecture or record your lectures and just see how often actually you ask questions um, and how often they're answered and who answers them. And for most of us, it's much less than we think during a during a didactic lecture. So I've got a question for you now. Um, this question is about rationality and we're going to do three coin tosses. So this is coin toss sequence number one. This is heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, tails. So each of these sequences are 10 tosses of a coin, um, one after the other. What I'd like you to do is to tell me, somebody to tell me statistically which of these three coin tosses, one, two or three, is more likely. And I'm hoping someone, because I can't see the chat, I'm hoping somebody will just unmute and, and tell us. Number two. Thank you very much. Number two. Any other votes? I'm going to go for number two as well, Mark. Thanks, Amy. Number two. Does anyone, does anybody disagree? OK, what I'm hoping is that your heart rates have increased a little bit, although I can't see you. Um, actually, statistically, each of these sequences is equally likely. Um, and that's because each toy, coin toss is independent of the previous coin toss. And that's a kind of core principle of statistical probability. But number two looks much, much more likely. It, number two looks random. And of course, we're much more likely to have a, some mixture of tails and heads in a random coin toss. Um, the difference is that that specific sequence of two tails, a head, a tail, two heads, two tails, a head, a tail, is just as likely as a sequence of all heads or all. Or, uh, that's that's so. The 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 statistics of the probability are the same. Uh, so I'm not surprised that the response was for number two. That's how 90 99 percent of people would would answer this question. The the purpose of me doing that, rather than just to keep you awake. Um, was to demonstrate that human beings are not very rational. We're, our brains do not work in a rational way. And the whole subject of behavioural economics um, and a lot of social psychology over the last 40 to 50 years, um, perhaps that's been the main theme of social psychology and behavioural economics, which is that old model that economists still widely use of kind of rational economic man or woman um, just isn't true. Um, and people make really irrational decisions all the time. And our brains are not very well wired to, to be rational. So there's a, a very nice book by Daniel Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize for Economics, Thinking Fast and Slow. And it's full of examples of how people are just not very rational in their decision making. So that raises a, a really interesting question. Um, and, and it links to the idea of dialogue. And the question is, if there are all these examples of human beings being irrational, then what's the purpose of rationality? Um, why did it evolve? What's it for? Because clearly, um, in these experiments, when we isolate an individual and ask them to figure out some some problem like that. It might be a mathematical problem, but it's often a problem of everyday life. For example, a classic 
economics example is that people are much um, more willing to um, are much less willing to lose an amount of money or lose something than they are to gain something. The degree of pleasure taken in gaining something is much less than the degree of displeasure in losing something. Um, and that means that from an economic point of view, um, that's irrational. Um, but that's how people people are evolved and how their brains work. So um, I, I'm go I want to emphasize the importance of dialogue. Um, and dialogue's not just about keeping you awake. Um, one of the one of the really interesting suggestions about why dialogue is so important um, comes from this book, which to my mind is perhaps the most important book in social consciousness um, and cognitive uh, social awareness um, published in the last decade. So this is by Mercier and Sperber, The Enigma of Reason. And what it suggests is that rationality, the, the ability to think critically, if you like, evolved in social contexts. And that's not surprising. Human beings uh, are fundamentally social animals. And that although we know we're really bad at making rational decisions on our own, um, and that's true of experts as well, by the way, if you think of lots of uh, lots and lots of examples of very, very clever people doing very, very silly things um, once they step outside of their expertise. Um, so individuals are not very rational, but groups are much more rational. And Mercier and Sperber bring a lot of evidence to suggest that rationality works when it's in dialogue, when it's a process of people talking with each other and critiquing each other's ideas. So we're not very good at critiquing our own ideas, but we're really good at critiquing other people's ideas. And if you can have the correct format of dialogue, then that's the that's the the focus or the forum in which rationality can emerge. So this is a really interesting idea, and it underpins some of what um, I'm going to say about the pedagogy of dialogue. Um, so at this point, it's useful to to just give a little quote from from this work by Bain. I really like this work. What Bain did was he uh, studied. Um, he, he, this was in the United States, and he looked at teachers in higher education, but also further education settings. Um, so this is adult education, but not only universities. And his question was, well, what makes a good teacher? Um, and he he tried to find out um, who were good teachers by basically by asking people. And sometimes we think, oh, it's hard to know who's a good teacher. But actually, usually in most institutions, um, both the students and the staff were able to say, oh, yes, you know, um, Dr. Y or Professor X actually is, is really good. Um, and he found that the single biggest indicator of good teaching was this, that good teachers treated um, what they said to their students as a conversation rather than a performance. And I really like that that quote. So just a little example of how we might encourage some feeling of dialogue um, in large classes. This is a metaphor and a, an approach I've used for many years. Um, it, it comes from the idea of going on a long journey, an arduous journey. And if you get stones or grit, um, sharp material in your boot um, and you ignore it, then that can be a real problem. Um, and I I can have experience of that myself on expeditions where you get a blister on your foot and the blister gets infected. And then that small thing, that small problem, a small piece of grit can destroy the expedition and actually endanger your life if you're not careful. So it's really important to, to, to take care um, and deal with those small problems. Um, by analogy, uh, uh, particularly for new classes where people don't know you, they don't know the rules, they don't know if dialogue is possible or even letting you know, um, I think we have to give opportunities for our students in those large settings, in lecture theatres of 150 or 200. We've got to give opportunity for people to feed back to us, to tell us what's going on. Um, I call this boot grit. So. Um, it might be, and, and the point is, it might be very small. So it might be something really during uh, an hour lecture, somebody realizes, oh, I didn't get 
I didn't get the un, I didn't understand the definition of radioactive decay of a half life, for example. Um, but it was in the middle of a lecture. I ignored it. But now, because I don't understand that, I'm really struggling to understand the idea of isotopic dating. And therefore, I don't really understand this piece of geology or evolution that we're talking about. So it can become really problematic. So I think we have to work to give opportunities for students to to share these problems. Um, that's partly to resolve the problems, but it's also to demonstrate that it's OK to talk. We're going to talk in this big lecture. So um, boot grip might be small, but it can cause academic blisters of ignored. Um, you can do this in lots of different ways. I still quite like the old fashioned way of just pieces of paper in a box. In fact, literally in a boot. Um, you can do this. And uh, so it might be 100, 150 pieces of paper at the end of a lecture. Of course, there are ways of doing it electronically as well um, and with texts. One of the features that you find when you do this in large lectures is that you do not get 150 or 200 separate comments, um, which would be overwhelming. What What's interesting is that there will be one or two things that people bring up um, consistently. And the students are not telling you this in the class, or at least most students do not, because they don't want to interrupt the lecture. They don't feel they can. So in other words, perhaps most of the class is sitting there thinking, I didn't understand that, or they're just going into micro sleeps. Um, none of them are saying it. So if you give them an opportunity to say it, they will do. Um, and you can feed back on those issues straight away. And just to make it positive as well. I always like to ask about thought stones. Thought stones are the opposite of boot grit. They're the they're the things that you want to hold on to. So they're those pleasing rounded stones that you might pick on a beach and take with you as a as a memento of your pleasant walk. And um, it's great to ask students to just write down, yeah, what what are you going to take from this lecture? What did you really like? It might be an idea, but it might be a feeling. It might be um, uh, you know, a, a, a new person you've met could be could be anything. The other way you can use boot grip once you've established that practice in your classes, um, you can use it to collect very quick information and feedback, um, boot grip feedback, if you like, on how you're doing. So uh, this and I, and I just quite like um, what's going well, what's not going so well, what should I change? Um, that's a really if you don't do that early on, uh, most of us collect, we have to collect evaluative feedback at the end of lectures, uh, at the end of modules, at the end of courses, but it's too late then. And in fact, I think that disrespects students because they know that what they say will not count in their own learning. It might influence learning in the future. So I don't like that form of evaluation. Um, I much prefer this because it's immediate and I can just say to the students, well, thanks last week, you told me that the chairs are really uncomfortable. Let's move about. I didn't know the chairs were uncomfortable. I don't sit in them. So uh, can you complain about the chairs? I think I did complain about the chairs. I'm not sure if it, anything happened, but at least I was able to say to students, OK, these chairs are uncomfortable. Let's stand up a bit. Let's move around. Let's, you know, I was forgetting that they were physical creatures. Um, so really, these are very simple tips, but I find them very effective. Um, just a summary of uh, actually more than 10 years of data. Um, if I ask my class, I'm not going to tell you <laughs> what they don't like. So I'm flattering myself here. If I just summarize those comments um, uh, from first year students, what do you like about this class? Um, this is what I get. Um, this is really interesting, isn't it? Interaction in class, which is to do with dialogue, one of my main themes. This is where I attempt to create dialogue um, is the most popular, consistently the, the most popular, or it's the item that's named most often um, as a good thing. And you can divide these these things into into the three E's, which is um, a summary um, that comes from a, an Edinburgh academic. Um, these are Noel Entwistle's three E's of good teaching, and he says, um, it's quite helpful to remember explanation, empathy, enthusiasm. If you can get all of those, then most students will um, will be happy with you. So 
these aspects reflect, at least to some extent, um, one or more of Enbrasil's E's. OK, so I, I've given you a theoretical reason why dialogue is important. Um, I've shown that students, uh, at least if you do it well, um, students appreciate opportunities for dialogue. Um, but that doesn't mean that it helps learning in a particular lecture. And one of the problems, of course, is that it takes up time. So if you if you're dealing with a lecture of 100, 150, 200 students and you say, OK, we're going to have a little bit of dialogue. We're going to have a problem solving session. We're going to I'm going to give you a definition. I want you to apply it to this particular context or I want you to work out this mathematical problem um, or I want you to speak to your neighbour um, and tell them why you think um, uh, obesity is a problem in society or whatever it is, a little interaction like that. I call these interactive windows. That takes up time and um, and it's hard to organise in a in a large lecture theatre because you have to get people to turn around and so on. And some students might just ignore you. They might not refuse to do it. So all of those things might mean that it's not very effective for learning. Um, if you do the experiment, I, I once had the opportunity to, to to run a kind of controlled experiment on this because I was teaching parallel classes. And so I was able to um, assign certain topics to interactive windows and assign other topics to just didactic teaching. And I was able to compare the marks in final assessments for those topics and look at you know, what happened when they were open windows and if you like, if when they were closed windows, when they were just normally taught. And you get, uh, thankfully, I was pleased with this, you get a significant effect on student learning. So if students have um, dealt with something in class in a problem solving dialogical manner, if they've talked about it, then they perform better on those topics. OK, so that was a little bit about context uh, uh, dialogue. I'm sorry. I want to talk about context now, um, the idea of putting knowledge to work um, in the right context. And here's, a, here's an example from my own um, area of biological research. Um, I like mangroves. Um, these are mangroves in East Africa, actually, not in Malaysia. Um, but when we're talking about mangroves, um, we might we might talk about them in all sorts of different ways, depending on the context. So one way of talking about them, for example, is an opportunity to sequester up to 800 million tonnes of CO2 per year. Um, that's a perfectly reasonable thing to say in some contexts. Um, but uh, you might also say they're an evolutionary marvel, filling a glaring empty niche at higher latitudes. Um, that's an equally reasonable and scientific thing to say. But you might also see mangroves as a symbol of existential dread and colonial wickedness, a completely different point. Um, so this is a quote drawn from Joseph Conrad, Heart of Darkness, which is one of the most famous books written about the colonial experience, um, referring to Africa and particularly the Belgians in Africa. And in this book, Conrad uses mangroves as a kind of symbol of everything that's exotic and weird and dark and forbidding, um, a, a symbol of existential despair. He talks about there as, you know, nature herself had tried to ward off intruders in and out of rivers, streams of death in life whose banks were rotting into mud, whose waters thickened into slime invaded the contorted mangroves that seemed to writhe at us in the extremity of an impotent despair. How about that? Now, that's, 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 that's excellence. Um, so talking about mangroves with excellence in the context of a novel, um, uh, you know, an early 20th century novel on colonialism, that's world excellence. Um, but that would, would not be very appropriate if we wanted to talk to investors on in blue carbon or indeed to, to students about, um, about the evolution of mangroves. So I'm making the very simple but important point that we need to always show the context 
of our of our work and it's really hard this is really difficult for students to understand the right context for work um, the best way can we can do that is probably through exemplars so examples specific examples of knowledge doing its job in particular contexts so this is about showing not telling um, it's inspiration for students if students see a particular example they think i can do that it can give really rapid feedback and feed forward so um, helping to give students information that will improve their performance next time um, and you can use exemplars in dialogue you can show them and then you can talk about them um, just a little bit of evidence that that works this is some research that we conducted a few years back looking at online exemplars um, there are almost a thousand students in this study and we were able to um, ask colleagues across the university here at Edinburgh Napier to post exemplars on their virtual learning environment, um, their Moodle platforms. And we could follow up the amount of times or whether or not individual students accessed those exemplars online. So this was anonymous, but we could find out students use of the exemplars. And there's a highly significant difference here in the in the marks that the students achieved uh, in their end of module assessments. Um, of course, this is confounded a bit because, well, the better students, the more motivated students are more likely to access those resources. Um, so it's not perfect evidence, but it, nevertheless, it's evidence that looking at exemplars helps students um, engage with knowledge. So exemplars are important and that helps put knowledge in context. Um, I want to talk briefly about feedback, and that's a really big topic. Um, it's, uh, but it's a really important one, uh, and it's part of active learning. So I like Cross's comment, feedback, learning without feedback is like archery practice in the dark. Students, you know, if they don't know what they're aiming for, then they're going to miss the target. And Brown here is, talks about feedback as being perhaps the best tested principle in psychology. So it's it's really important. Um, it's important, but it's often done badly in higher education. Uh, in the UK, we have a national student survey uh, which asks questions, various questions on all sorts of organisation, of course, and, um, you know, whether students feel engaged with their student union and other things. It's a national survey and it covers all the universities. The, perhaps the most consistent theme in that survey is dissatisfaction with assessment and feedback. Um, so these questions, has feedback on my work been prompt? I've received detailed comments. Feedback on my work has helped me clarify things I did not understand. Almost every year that that survey has been running, that question gets the lowest mark or those groups of questions, sorry, on feedback gets the lowest mark. And of course, staff also really hate the process of feedback. So the biggest complaint um, we, we know from most of our colleagues most of the time is, oh, I've got all this marking to do. So it causes dis dissatisfaction both sides. Um, I've just drawn some uh, some examples of written comments from uh, evaluations of feedback at our own university. Now I'm showing you the bad stuff here um, and this is anonymized and it's I hope it's not I know it's not representative but it's quite shocking when you read some of these comments and actually our university at Renate does quite well compared to most UK institutions but students might say it takes me a long time to get feedback um, feedback's often vague, doesn't go into much detail. Um, I hate it when the feedback's half a sentence long. I put a hell of a lot of effort into a report. It doesn't look like they've taken the time to read it. That's awful, isn't it? That's terrible. I never got constructive feedback from my coursework. I only got a grade for them. So it's really uncomfortable, isn't it, when we hear that kind of comment. and We're really missing an opportunity um, to encourage active learning there. Um, so just a suggestion um, about feedback, uh, which links to Entwistle's third E about empathy um, and treating students as individuals. It's hard to do that in large classes. 
I'm a big fan of audio oral feedback. Um, one of the reasons for that is that the tone of voice can express empathy in a way that written feedback cannot. And um, it's actually faster. I find it faster once you get used to it. It's faster than writing comments and students can receive this very easily now on their phones or digitally. I don't know if this is going to work, but I'll, I'll have a go. I'm not sure. Did anyone hear that? Oh, no, we did not. Ah, OK, no. um, so it's coming out of my speakers, but so basically there's a there's a small audio uh, an mpa file embedded in this in this slide um and it's just me talking to emma and i use her her first name um which is a little bit controversial because we may need to anonymize marking but that doesn't mean that you can not reveal the identity of the student afterwards so speaking to per somebody as a person and just saying well thanks very much for this work i really like this but have you considered doing this, this and this? Students respond really well to this kind of feedback, surprisingly well. Um, I, I was I was really pleasantly surprised when I started doing this. And part of it is about empathy. So um, this is sometimes helpful, the guidance and feedback loop. Um, this is uh, what we can perhaps aspire to in designing our courses. We can think about students' prior experiences of assessments, give them preliminary guidance, use exemplars of previous work, give feedback on their initial work, perhaps a model answer if we've, if we've, if we've got very large classes. We can embed engagement with feedback so we can require, for example, and say, right, tell me what you thought about that feedback. I'm going to assess your assessment of the feedback. That becomes feed forward um, and so on. Uh, we've got to be much more sophisticated with feedback than we usually are. And that might mean doing less assessment to create um, space for it. I think this is my last slide. I've gone on a little bit longer than I intended, um, but I wanted to finish on a kind of high minded element. Um, so this is Jürgen Habermas and Habermas is uh, one of the grandfathers of European democratic philosophy and thought. Um, so he's a very interesting thinker, but he part of his thinking is around rationality and how we create conditions for truth um, and for civic society. And he has this idea of ideal speech situations. Um, and those are situations where everybody present feels able to contribute their thoughts and ideas without being inhibited by differences in power, differences in money, differences in status. So that's perhaps a utopian ideal. Whether that ever happens or not is another question. But he thinks it's where we, we these are conditions we should try to encourage and create. And not only does he think that's important for learning, but for him that kind that that forms the foundation of democratic society. Um, so he's going all the way back to Socrates and the Greeks when he thinks about that. So I want to finish with this idea of active learning and particularly dialogue being uh, not only we, we use it not only because it keeps our students awake. Um, we use it because it's more effective, but also um, I, I'm with Habermas on this. It's a fundamental function of higher education. Um, it's our civic function to try to create citizens who are capable of contributing um, to a, a democratic policy and polity. Um, and if we don't do that at universities, where, where are students going to learn that? So I will stop there, um, apologise for going on a little bit and hope we've got a little bit of time if you're still with me for, for any questions. Thank you, Professor Huxman. If, do we have um, questions or comments from the audience? Thank you for sharing that, um, Professor. We enjoyed it and it it makes it look very doable in a setting that is in a large classroom, uh, not necessarily having to have enough space for us, for the students to move around. So it's based on the three um, principles that you shared. 
uh, dialogue, feedback, and context. So it's 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 really up here and and engaging them, the students, in on that cognitive level. Do you have any any examples of um, um, situations where students appreciate or can benefit from using their hands? and their body movement instead of the just the three. Do, would you like to uh, share something on that? That's a really nice question. Thank you. <laughs> and Thank you. I, 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 I do. And that's one of the I'm fortunate being an ecologist that um, <laughs> part of my subject is that we can go out. And uh, yes. Be so that's a natural thing. And, and for the you slide guys. I showed at the start is of Hannah using yeah. her hands to show us a crustacean. Yeah, and yeah. she's a she's a PhD student who's who's an expert in crustacea and actually touching things is really important isn't it mm -hmm. um it's a way that we learn and that kind of, we call it a haptic learning that, that that idea of actually physically making contact is really important mm -hmm. so it's something that we get to do a lot in our in our topic and I guess if you're an engineer you would do that or you should do that a lot perhaps if you're a medic too one of the interesting things is that we have a large school of nursing here at Edinburgh Napier and touching for nurses is very important um, through learning but also of course for emotional reasons and so they learn how, how to touch they're taught how to do that thank you other questions I'd like to invite Dr. Jana, Dr. Jana Chiu, if you have any comments. Dr. Jana is one of our active ADEC participants who does active learning in class and she's well loved by her students. I'm not sure if she's, ar not sure if she's around. Maybe we can hear from her. No. Unfortunately, no. Because <laughs> I saw her name earlier. the questions from the audience the other thing I I noticed that um, um, in us building ourselves as academics you're putting you as an example you are an expert in your own field technically speaking and also the teaching and learning part so do you think it is a good idea to separate the teaching and learning tr um, like if we build if we build ourselves in the line of teaching and learning while not investing enough in our research of our true field what do you think about that do, how much do you, th do you think that they complement each other the teaching and learning path and also the research and your field of expertise that's a that's a another great question and <laughs> a really big topic isn't it yeah I, I i think it would be nice to say that all oh, the best teachers are the best researchers and the mm. ideal is you know to get the balance between both of those activities those academic activities in the UK, I would say that's still, in theory, the model of academics that most institutions at least formally have. In practice, it clearly isn't the case in, for, for many, perhaps most people. So for most academics and perhaps most institutions, they're increasingly dividing the roles. Mm. And it's certainly true that you can be an excellent teacher without being an active researcher. Um, again, that's this political rhetoric that, oh, you know, our elite universities are students are, it's much better for students to go there because of all these elite researchers. And it's not true because mostly the students don't meet those elite researchers, at least the undergraduates, mm -hmm. and they're taught by other people, sometimes not academics at all. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of political dis dishonesty really about it. Uh, for me, combining the two is really important. Um, 
partly because I do a lot of teaching anyway. So I should know about it. And there are lots of academics who find themselves teaching, don't necessarily are not necessarily invested in it, mm. but perhaps don't make the effort to look at the, the literature and think about how they might research their own teaching and learn about teaching. And you know, that's a fact that was certainly me at the start of my career. I did I knew nothing about teaching and I was my poor students were inflicted. <laughs> I was inflicted on them. And so I thought I really have to you know, learn about this. And I discovered that it was very interesting and that I could contribute mm -hmm. through research and teaching. Mm -hmm. So that was really nice experience. Um, and I think if you're so if you're doing a lot of teaching, it's really incumbent. It's important on you to to be a scholar and to learn a little bit about teaching. That doesn't mean you have to be an expert, but I think you yeah. have to do that. So I'm not saying that everybody has to do that. And of course, institutional settings are different. Sometimes for some people it's impossible to do disciplinary research. For other people, they're under enormous pressure to do that and they have to fit teaching around that. But, you know, we have to try to push against those pressures. And I, I do think that ideal of a balanced academic life with teaching and research still remains something that we should aspire to. Um, and for some, for perhaps particularly for applied topics. I mentioned nursing. Mm -hmm. I think, to t for example, to teach nursing, but to, to not be a practitioner anymore, to never go into a ward and never deal with, with, with patients, that would be really difficult. I think you'd lose authority. Um, so, you know, it's a little bit like that for my topic. If I was teaching ecology, but I never actually went into the field, um, I think my students would start to see that I, I, I lost authority to teach them. Mm. Yes, it's very true. Makes, make, makes us wonder and, and contemplate on what we have been doing so far as, as academics, especially if we are young researchers and young academics here in the room. Thank and I think sure. a lot of us feel under pressure. I know yeah. particularly early career researchers under a lot of pressure to focus on high status research. Mm -hmm. and that comes from institutionals and it's it's an international system in universities isn't it around ranking mm. and we need to push against that because we should we should maintain careers for the long term and keep our the interests of our students and society at, at large central rather than having to compete all the time for you know there's nothing wrong with competition and there's nothing wrong with getting those research grants but we need if we have influence at universities we need to push against the culture that forces people down specialized lines like that mm -hmm. thank you for sharing that i believe uh, we we will have um interest from um audience who would like to try if they haven't already tried active learning your advice on where to start how small how big do you start? Yeah, start, start, start small and it can be scary um, and especially if the students are not used to that culture. So it's harder, for example, to start with a third or fourth year class that, have, that are very used to a different kind of perhaps a more passive learning. Um, so I think it's great to start with first year students if you mm -hmm. can, if you've got them and to start small and just start trying to have a dialogue and you might be surprised. So Give, the key thing is to give opportunities to students to speak to you anonymously because they they may you may not think you seem scary to them. Maybe you're <laughs> not scary to them, but, you know, that's not how I think about it. But lots of students are intimidated by me and I, I don't think of myself as intim being intimidated. In fact, quite the opposite. But for lots of students, lots of young students, they see me as intimidating. So you've got to give opportunities for students to to speak without revealing who they are to start with and that builds mm, trust mm, okay okay we do have a question from uh, dr jana would you like to switch on your microphone and ask the question yourself no i think she has a problem with her mic is there an effective way to measure active learning that's a question um, in response yes there is if it's just about measuring your own practice to see if it's working then um, proper evaluation with your students is really powerful now i know that's not the same as measuring learning 
but you can do it very quickly, um, as I've been emphasising. And in fact, there is a strong correlation between what students say they like and how they perform. Um, it's not always true. So as human beings, sometimes we don't know what's good for us, as it were. But in general, if students are enjoying your sessions, they're likely to be learning more. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a very quick and easy way to do it. But of course, you could go all the way through to do proper formal research. Um, for example, the like the research I did on open on, on active learning and on, on, on interactive windows. And you might be surprised at how little um, good research, good uh, particularly experimental research like that is done in education. There are ethical reasons why we can't have randomised experiments in education yeah. often. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you have opportunities to do that without negatively affecting students. So it's it's always good to think about your teaching that way. And particularly if you've got a difficult class and you're weary with the with the burden of it, you turning it into a research problem makes it much more exciting. Mm, agree. We have we have reached five o'clock, but I have one last question. You mentioned about ethics. Would you like to explain um, or elaborate a little bit more how we should be careful about ethics? Because I do get um, academics who come to ADEC and wanting to do um, teaching and learning based research and they don't know how to deal with the um, ethics part because they want to randomize but they can't randomize but then they were worried about the validity of the results and things. Would you like to elaborate a little bit on that? Thank you. Yes, I think if of course, it's a really important area to consider. And there are many things that we might like to do in education, which we cannot for ethical reasons. We might like to do from a research perspective, I mean. But it's not so. I'm an experimental biologist and I, mm -hmm. I enjoy doing experiments. That's my background. <laughs> um, I usually can't do a fully randomized experiment in my classes. But quite often I can do, if you like, a pseudo randomized experiment. So, for example, I can do one thing one year and something different the next. Mm -hmm. um, quite often, if you're introducing a new innovation, you can evaluate that innovation um, that year and the year after and compare it with what went before. Now, of course, that's not an ideal experiment because times have changed. Mm -hmm. But if you have enough data from before and after, that's a pretty convincing, can be a pretty convincing intervention. And you can compare what you're doing with, you know, the classes of your colleagues who are perhaps not doing that. Mm -hmm. So often there are ways around this. The other possibility is to use formative assessment so it doesn't count for students' formal grades. Um, it's not summative. Um, and you can do experiments with that. So mm -hmm. provided students are on board, a good way of doing that is to involve the students as co-researchers mm -hmm. so they know absolutely about it. They're learning about the research process. They might even many of my students have had publications, you know, become co-authors on educational publications. That's really good for them. Um, so there's no sense in which you're exploiting students or using them just as research subjects. They're engaged fully in the research. Mm -hmm. you, you can only do that with probably with smaller classes with more advanced students but mm -hmm. that's a lot of fun it, it takes longer but it's a lot of fun maybe we'll have another session to talk about that the role of students as researchers i i know you shared it with us in adec last time but perhaps for another another session well that, that would really, be lovely that and would be really nice <laughs> it's really yeah. nice to join you i hope i haven't done too much didactic passive no, no, you, at you. <laughs> if only we could show our faces and unmute our giggles, <laughs> you would be, yes, you, would, you yeah. would feel our presence. So thank yeah. you so much, Professor Mark Huxon, for your time and, and sharing with us all. I am sure we all learn a, a lot from here. It gives us some some courage to, to try new things, having heard from a non education faculty person a biologist like yourself which is quite comforting and you've published in in academic journals on teaching and learning which is you know um, a good thing for us to know that yes this can be done and we don't have to be from an education background to do teaching and learning research no and you can bring all of your expertise there's so much <laughs> expertise that you can apply to education 
Thank you so much for that. Such a nice way of ending the day for us. And, and a nice way to start for me. Thank, thank you, you so much. We really lovely to, see to be you with you. And, okay. and I hope we interact again soon. We will. We will definitely. Thank you, everybody, for sharing. Good evening. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.